As a reporter, I've traveled around the Middle East for many years. It's an area that has always fascinated me, but in my work, I've mainly covered its war zones, its crises, and its tragedies. This journey, which takes me down the Silk Road in the footsteps of Marco Polo, gives me the opportunity to explore the great historical and cultural significance of this part of the world, its ancient melting pot of peoples and civilizations that have contributed so much to our own. There's always something rather cozy about trains. Inside, everyone settles into a new life. It's a great place to meet people and find out more about other cultures. On the outside too, the train gliding smoothly through the scenery is at home wherever it goes. While our societies continue to be built up around streets and roads, trains move out into the environment, deep into the heartland. Here in the 250,000 square kilometers of the great salt desert of Dashti Kavir, only a few rare camels watch the trains go by. In the oasis of Kashan lies the Garden of Fin. It's a beautiful example of the love that the Iranians have for the art of the garden, and in particular for cultivating roses, which originated in Persia or China. Spring is over. While in Tehran it was still cold enough for people to go skiing in the mountains, here in Kashan, in the middle of the desert, it's already 40 degrees Celsius, which helps us understand why water gardens like this one here in Fin Garden are considered a symbol of paradise in Persian culture. The Muslim conquerors who came out of the vast Arabian deserts were amazed by these gardens when they invaded Iran under the Caliph Umar in the 7th century. They soon learned the techniques for creating water displays from the Persians and took them to the farthest reaches of the Arab Empire, to Andalusia, where in Granada, one can still admire the elegance of the famous gardens in the Alhambra. continue to make our way southeast across the Great Desert in order to find out more about one of the most fascinating elements in Iranian culture, Zoroastrianism. I have to admit that it's a religion that greatly intrigues me. In its initial form, Mazdaism, it has existed for thousands of years. It's a syncretic religion, a mixture of East and West, and it revolves around the struggle between the good spirit, Spenta, and the evil spirit, Angra. Zoroastrians worship the sun, the source of all light, which is embodied in Atta, the sacred fire, whose flame is kept burning day and night in the temples. Even though Zoroastrianism has been a monotheistic religion for over 2,000 years, its followers were persecuted as pagans by the Muslims after the Arabs conquered Persia in the year 642. The Zoroastrians found refuge by going far out into the desert, or sometimes up onto a cliff face like this one in Chakchak where, as the legend goes, an Iranian princess, the daughter of the last king of the Sassanid dynasty, hid herself in order to continue practicing her faith. The name Chakchak comes from the sound of the drops of water that seep out and fall from the wall of the cave, which is now a sanctuary. Thank you. There's something quite moving about seeing this ancient religion still being practiced today. It goes back at least 3,000, maybe even four or 5,000 years, so even before the invention of writing. It began as Mazdaism from the god Mazda, and later on in the 6th century BC, with the prophet Zarathustra, or Zoroaster, it became one of the first monotheistic religions. There are 40,000 Zoroastrians still living in Iran today. They're a tolerated minority in the Islamic Republic. The 
Concernant l'eau qui coule Does the water that flows out of the cliff and drips down from the rock have any special meaning in Zoroastrian worship? Zoroastrian? Yes, that's right. It's associated with the shekshek. Look behind you. You'll see a basin. The shekshek sound is always there. Sometimes it's louder, sometimes it's softer. If you come during the Nowruz period, you'll see water flowing from all of these mountains. As far as we know, this shekshek sound has been going on for 1,400 years. That's why the Muslims gave it that name. We Zoroastrians call this place Pir e Sabz. And it allows us to provide water to the entire region, the best and the healthiest water. But we don't know where this water comes from. Many people look at this dry, dry desert and they ask, how can there be so much water there? Is it a miracle? Not only does it never stop flowing, but it also meets the water needs of 1,000 to 3,000 people every single day. There are three Zoroastrian Magi who have gained international fame. Their names are Balthazar, Gaspar and Melchior. According to Marco Polo, they reigned over a small territory near Sabi, not far from the present-day Tehran. According to the Bible, they followed a star to Bethlehem to worship the newborn Christ. What they did, in fact, was follow the old caravan route to the Mediterranean. Zoroastrian culture is linked in many ways to the Silk Road. For example, the Zoroastrians used musk for their purification rituals, which are an integral part of their religious practice. Musk is obtained from the gland of the small musk deer, which belongs to the family Muskidae and lives in the high altitudes up in the Himalayas. It was regarded as a luxury perfume in ancient times and it made the fortune of the caravaneers who imported it from Tibet to Yazd, which is still a stronghold of Zoroastrianism today. 98% of the population in Iran is Muslim. However, Zoroastrian ideas and language have permeated Persian culture to such a point that they continue to be tolerated and even celebrated, for example here in Yazd. As a result of its strategic location on the Silk Road, standing at the crossroads between India and Central Asia, Yazd became a very prosperous city. In his writings, Marco Polo expresses his admiration for the local crafts, and in particular, for the silks embroidered with gold. The merchants continue to perpetuate this tradition in Yazd. Another ancient Persian custom that is still very popular here is the Yurkana, literally the house of strength. Thank you. Over the centuries, the training exercises used by traditional wrestlers have become a sport in themselves, a very ritualized sport. The athletes, called pavlevan or heroes, work out together in a group, practicing in rhythm along with ritual songs and to the sound of a drum. The songs are both sacred and profane, alternating between verses by the great Persian poet Hafiz and passages from the famous Iranian epic, the Shahnameh. Current day pavlevan rarely meet for resting matches, but they do train to music almost every day. The owner of the Zokane, who is a former champion himself, is also the drummer. He's known as the Morshed, or the spiritual guide. What is your role as the Morshed, as the ritual master who plays the drum and leads the players? In the Zorkana, the Morshed is like a pillar. The Morshed guides the athletes with his drumming and his songs. The poetic lyrics he sings help encourage and energize the athletes. What's the connection between your sport and the wrestling that's so popular here in Iran? The wrestlers practice the Zorkana exercise as a warm-up before the match. The 
The Zurkane exercises are a preliminary to the Palevani, the wrestling. Now, in terms of the moral and mystical meaning of the sport, the athletes must strive to attain a certain character, must have good moral qualities, must be ethical so as to be a model for others in terms of principles and piety, a model of purity and virtue. All of the training is done in this little arena or pit. Why? What does it mean? The pit is sacred. It represents the modesty and humility of the ancient athletes in relation to those around them. The athletes are lower than the spectators, which means I am inferior to you. I am humble, both in terms of my sports activity and in my behavior. The pit also symbolizes the grave, which is its spiritual meaning. Every one of us is buried when we die. When our lives come to an end and we leave this world, we are buried deep down in a grave. So when we're down in this pit, much lower than everyone else, we always have that in mind, death and the grave. When we practice in the Zurkane, there's a hierarchy, from the youngest to the oldest, from the beginning to the veteran and the professional. The younger ones show respect to their elders, and those who have more knowledge, skills and experience receive more deference and respect. You have drums and you have these dance exercises in which you spin around like certain Sufi dervishes. Is there a mystical aspect to your sport? Practicing these spinning exercises would enable a warrior armed with a sword or a mace to defend himself on all sides in a battle. By whirling around, he's able to keep his enemies away from him. But from a mystical point of view, if we look at the spinning in the Zerkane, it does not come from Sufi turning. In the mystical philosophy of the Zurkane exercises, we spin in a circle. We go from the edge to the center, and when we get to the center, we stop spinning. From the outer edges in towards the oneness, the unity, the symbol of rectitude. We turn around the horizon and then encounter the greatness of the Creator. Perpetuating an ancestral tradition like this in such a natural, straightforward way is ultimately very Iranian. Another age-old tradition that one comes across in almost every corner in Yazd is the wind catcher. This is a chimney device that funnels the breeze in order to ventilate and cool the inside of a house or a building. You might think this is just a picturesque old relic of days gone by, but in fact, not at all. It works very well. In spite of the sweltering heat in Yazd, the ventilation system in these adobe houses makes them surprisingly comfortable, even at midday, when everyone takes refuge inside. Yazd is now the main center of Zoroastrianism in Iran. There are more than 40,000 fire worshippers in the country today, and 30,000 of them live in Yazd. And to be exact, they don't actually worship fire. The flame is a symbol, and keeping it alive is like a form of prayer. The sacred fire in the great Zoroastrian temple at Ashkede in Yazd has been burning continuously for 1,500 years, as the priest Mehraban Afarin tells me.
Right now as we talk, who's tending the fire? And in general, how have you kept this fire burning for 1,500 years? A Zoroastrian priest comes and feeds the fire. Feeding the fire basically entails putting a piece of wood on the hearth four or five times a day to keep it going. It has to do with remembering the past. In the past, when people couldn't light their own fire, they would use fire from the temple, bringing it back to their homes to cook food and for other purposes. And so today, in remembrance of that time, we keep this fire lit and we respect it. We pray five times a day before the light. This light can be the light of a fire or the light of the sun. We stand there before the light which symbolizes clarity, purity, sincerity and truth, and we pray to the one and unique God. So is Zoroastrianism considered to be the oldest monotheistic religion in the world? Yes. Zoroastrianism is one of the oldest religions in the world. After that came Christianity, Judaism and finally Islam, which is the most recent. We are recognized by the Islamic Public of Iran, by the Constitution of the Islamic Republic of Iran. We have our own representative in Parliament. We live and worship freely in Iran. They respect us and consider our religion to be one of the official religions of the country. In other words, after Islam, Judaism, Christianity and Zoroastrianism are all religions of the book and should all be respected. On the outskirts of Yazd stand the Towers of Silence. In order to avoid polluting the sky and the earth, the Zoroastrians would leave the bodies of their deceased on top of these towers to be exposed to the sun and to vultures. Ideas move about freely and may sometimes turn up in unexpected places. For example, Zoroastrian thought inspired what has now become one of the most famous books in Western philosophy, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, written by the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Not far from Yazd lies another prosperous oasis, Maybod. Its wealth comes from its soil, its clay, which was also used to build this enormous castle called Narin Gali. It dates back to the era of the Medes Empire, which began in the year 1000 BC. The abundance of clay in this area made the fortune of the city and led to the development of a thriving pottery industry. Ceramics, earthenware and porcelain from Iran, and in particular from Maybod, are famous throughout all of Asia. formula, which is a mixture of marble powder and clay, comes from China, but the pottery making technique itself is an old Persian tradition. And combining the two together is emblematic of the cultural interweaving that takes place on the Silk Road. What's interesting here in Maybod is that the tradition is still flourishing, it's even gone industrial. To make beautiful translucent porcelain, the kaolin-based ceramic must be fired at a temperature of over 1200 degrees Celsius. Here, the painted designs are a mixture of motives that come from the Mediterranean and others that come from China. The method for making porcelain was in fact invented by the Chinese around the year 1000. Iranian ceramics were very popular in Europe during the 19th century, but they could no longer be exported after trade sanctions were imposed on Iran due to its nuclear program. A peace agreement has recently been signed between Tehran, Washington, Moscow and the other powers. 
The potters of Maybod, the modern-day heirs to a timeless art, are hoping their orders will start taking off again. Such is the impact of globalization, even in the middle of the desert. We're now on our way to visit one of Iran's national treasures. In fact, we could even say it's one of the jewels of Persian or even Arab Islamic culture as a whole. Isfahan, on the banks of the Zeander Rud, the life-giving river. The mythical city of Isfahan, already legendary at the time of the Silk Road on the hippie trail a few centuries later. This caravan city in the middle of the desert was in fact inhabited in Alexander the Great's time, but it didn't become the capital of the Persian Empire until the 16th century under Shah Abbas the Great. He decided to transform Isfahan into an architectural wonder, which gave rise to the saying, Isfahan is half the world. One could wander through the maze of bazaars, palaces and mosques in Isfahan for days. But it's the central square, known as Nakshe Jahan, that made the reputation of this former capital of the Safavid Empire. The city's most beautiful monuments are erected around the perimeter of this massive square, which is an architectural theatricalization of royal power. Sheikh Lotfala Mosque was built in the 17th century with a very original design. There's no forecourt, and the prayer hall lies directly beneath the dome of the mosque. Sheikh Lotfala Mosque is especially known for its decoration, for the lavish beauty of, among other things, its yellow onyx panels and glazed tiles. At the far end of the same monumental square, where polo matches were once played, stands the Great Shah Mosque. It was built in 1612 by Abbas I, the great Safavid emperor, who turned Isfahan into a symbol of the grandeur of Shia Islam. Practiced by a large majority of Iranians, this branch of Islam is called duodeciman Shiism because it only recognizes the first 12 Imams as successors of the Prophet Muhammad. Aesthetically, it's mind-blowing. This mosque is an architectural miracle. I'm literally in awe. People talk about the Taj Mahal, but in terms of Islamic architecture, I don't think I've ever seen anything so beautiful. Maybe the Alhambra in Granada, I don't know. Now watch and listen. Our friend Masood is going to do an experiment. Ah, oui. All right, the sound. On les... <coughs> ah, je parlais, je parlais de... Just now, I was talking about an architectural miracle. Mais, écoutez, but listen. Y a une the acoustics in here are astounding. Ici que this was where the muezzin would stand to perform the call to prayer. Écoutez. Listen. It's unbelievable. Every Friday, the great mosque fills up with people and the large awnings are installed to protect the crowds from the sun during the weekly prayer. Today, the Shah Mosque is called the Ayatollah Khomeini Mosque, after the Imam who founded the Islamic Republic in 1979, making Iran the largest theocracy in the world. The Iranians see the ancient imperial city of Isfahan not so much as the city of mosques, but rather as the city of bridges. There are two dozen bridges, with the most famous being perhaps the Siosepol with its 33 arches. Historically, it separated the Iranian town from the Jewish town. In Isfahan, as in Tehran, it is to the bridges that the city's inhabitants come to enjoy life and its moments of leisure to play music or eat pastries with family and friends, to flirt or recite poems to the soft melody of an oud. Iran, so gentle, so subtle, so refined. What a discovery, what a surprise, and what a delight this country was. I can see why the merchants went off so willingly to join the caravans on the Silk Road in order to travel through lands such as these.